Hey, it's Anita, and this is Bitcoin and Co. Mastering Freedom. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is another episode of Bitcoin and Co. and the context. Is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme? The story of Italian-born Carlo Ponzi confidence trickster of 1920. Thanks to my sponsors who make this episode possible. This is Local Bitcoins, where you can buy and sell Bitcoins peer-to-peer. Go to www.localbitcoins.com to buy and sell Bitcoin. Not your keys, not your coins is one of the basic rules in Bitcoin. Therefore, you can use a hardware wallet, which is the most recommended way to store Bitcoin safely in the long term. For instance, from Shift Crypto, the Swiss hardware wallet manufacturer with the Bitbox 02. Go to anita.link forward slash Bitbox02. And if you put the name Anita in the checkout as a checkout code, you get 10% off the price of the hardware wallet. And the other option for people who are overwhelmed with using a hardware wallet, there is the card wallet, produced by Coinfinity and the Austrian State Printing House. Order your card wallet at cardwallet.com forward slash Anita and get 20% off. In August 1920, the financial legend Charles Ponzi was arrested. In only a year, he had taken in $20 million from 10,000s of victims, often referred to as investors. His promise was to double their money within three months. In return for cash, investors received promissory notes that guaranteed the original investment plus 50% interest. These notes bore Ponzi's ink-stamped signature. Many referred to them as Ponzi notes. It was a classical Rob Peter to pay Pauline scheme that he didn't invent, nor did his conviction to three years in prison prevent other fraudsters from doing so too. In 1957, the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Wikipedia of its time, formally acknowledged that his name had become synonymous with swindle. The Ponzi scheme officially had a name. Charles Ponzi's Wikimedia entry assigns his occupation to the categories influencer, banker, autobiographer. No joke, in this order. On Wikipedia, he is said to be a financier and confidence trickster. Ponzi's roots in La Dolce Vita. Let's start from the beginning. Ponzi's short-term success had been decades in the making. His 38 years of life before were full of setbacks, misadventures, failures, and even two times in jail in pursuit of riches. Charles Ponzi was born in Lego, Italy, in spring 1882, named Carlo Ponzi. His family was comfortable but far from wealthy, richer in reputation than in savings. His father was descendant from middle-class hoteliers and tradesmen, but was working as a postman. His mother Imelde Ponzi's family was part of the aristocracy in the Duchy of Parma. She was staking the family's future on her only child Carlo, building castles in the air in her stories of the glory she hoped he would achieve. With the inheritance from his father, Ponzi was able to attend the University of Rome, only to gravitate toward a group of wealthy students who lived La Dolce Vita. Emigration to the United States in 1903 Soon the money was gone and the chances to earn a degree too. He had become an impoverished fop. Taking a mundane job would be beneath him. An uncle told him that the streets in the United States are paved with gold and he could make a fortune easily. In November 1903, Carlo Ponzi entered a ship bound to Boston. For the first four years, Ponzi worked as a grocery clerk, road drummer, factory hand and a dishwasher. He rarely lasted long. In America, Carlo Ponzi became Charles Bianchi. In 1907, he moved to Montreal and was hired as a clerk by an Italian bank, Banco Zarossi. 
But Mr. Tarossi was doing dubious banking business. He was paying higher interests than any other bank and was suspected to be paying one customer with another customer's money, an age-old fraud known as robbing Peter to pay Paul. The bank collapsed and 26-year-old Ponzi had, as usual, spent all the money he had earned. Wanting to hit the road, he stole and forged a check but was caught and sentenced to three years in prison. His epiphany to gain riches. Afterwards, Ponzi returned to the United States. And after nine years of taking different jobs, he was tired of making money for my employers and none for myself. With support of his wife, Rose, he rented a one-room office in Boston, spinning up ideas and working on projects that he thought would make him rich. That's how he found out about international reply coupons, the instrument he built his famous Ponzi scheme on top. It was an international postal currency that could be redeemed for stamps in any post office of a country belonging to the Universal Postal Union and was set up in 1906. Coupons purchased for one American dollar in New York yielded the equivalent of one dollar's worth of French stamps in Paris. But the Great War left some countries' currencies deeply devalued. Ponzi saw in it a global currency whose value fluctuated widely depending on where it was used. An opportunity to profit on arbitrage. Ponzi was delighted. He wouldn't only operate under the umbrella of the postal service. Everybody was a potential customer too. Even better. The supply of coupons was potentially limitless. Ponzi was certain that it was legal. He even admitted that it might be unethical, but... The nobody gave a rap for ethics. The almighty dollar was the only goal. In December 1919, Charles Ponzi was sure he found a legitimate, foolproof formula to get rich quick. He registered the Securities Exchange Company and began hunting for investors who had $10 to spare. We are all gamblers. We all crave easy money, and plenty of it. If we didn't, no get-rich-quick scheme could be successful. Ponzi believed. The good life. In early 1920, Ponzi's business started to take off. He never really exchanged international reply coupons for money, but took the model as an explanation where the 50% interest for his customers come from. In the seven months since opening business, the security exchange company had amassed 9.6 million from 30,000 investors. To keep them satisfied, he would have to pay them nearly 15 million in return. Ponzi bought himself and his wife a luxury home, a locomobile, the most expensive car of the time, driven by a chauffeur, and lived the life of a rich man. The end after a few months. In the meantime, government authorities, the postal office and the Boston Post, the paper, started to investigate his business and prior life. And Ponzi knew he couldn't last. He tried to find ways out, believing that he will make it. After the Boston Post reported about Ponzi's time in jail in Montreal, the financial investigations made clear that he didn't have the money to pay his victims back. Charles Ponzi was arrested on August 12, 1920. The news brought down six banks and Ponzi's investors were practically wiped out, receiving less than 30 cents to the dollar. They lost about 20 million in 1920 dollars. That's approximately 193 million dollars in 2019. Charles Ponzi was sentenced to five years in prison. In September 1925, Ponzi was released on bail and fled to Jacksonville, Florida, only to launch the Charpon Land Syndicate. Charpon is an amalgamation of his name. With this syndicate, he offered investors tiny tracts of land, some even underwater, and promised them 200% returns in 60 days. It was another scam that sold swampland in Columbia County. Ponzi again went to jail and was released in 1933. Ponzi's charismatic confidence had faded, and when he left the prison gates, he was met by an angry crowd. He told reporters before he left, I went looking for trouble, and I found it. October 7th, in 1933, 
Ponzi was officially deported to Italy. His beloved wife Rose stayed in the US and divorced Ponzi in 1937. She hadn't wanted to leave Boston and Ponzi was in no position to support her in any event. Charles and Rose stayed in contact, writing letters and missing each other. Ponzi spent the last years of his life in poverty, working occasionally as a translator. Ponzi died, age 66, in a charity hospital in Rio de Janeiro on January 18, 1949. He had $75 to his name, just enough for his burial. Rose wanted to have his body returned to Boston for a proper funeral, but she had lacked the money to do so. Rose was working as a bookkeeper and remarried in 1956. She lived a happy life and died aged 97 in 1993. Despite the divorce and the heartache, despite her dashed dreams and decades apart, the one thing that Ponzi never lost was Rose's love. Ponzi granted one last interview to an American reporter, confessing. My business was simple. It was the old game of robbing Peter to pay Paul. You would give me $100 and I would give you a note to pay you $150 in three months. My notes became more valuable than American money. Then came trouble. The whole thing was broken. While being seriously ill, he still maintained his optimism and believed the triumphant words he had used to end his memoirs. Life, hope, and courage are a combination which knows no defeat. Temporary setbacks. Perhaps, but utter and permanent defeat. Never. He also said later, even if they never got anything for it. It was cheap at that price, without malice aforethought. I had given them the best show that was ever staged in their territory since the landing of the Pilgrims. It was easily worth 15 million bucks to watch me put the thing over. The Peter to Pauline scheme did not die with him. People began to call these camps Ponzi schemes. In 1957, the Encyclopedia Britannica acknowledged that his name had become synonymous with swindle. Soon, the Oxford English Dictionary followed entering Ponzi scheme to the book, defined as a form of fraud in which belief in the success of a fictive enterprise is fostered by payment of quick returns to first investors from money invested by others. Interesting is that Charles Ponzi started talking of him instead of I when the Post printed the fraud story of Bank Tarossi, where he afterwards was sentenced to three years in jail for forgery. He twisted stories, excusing his fraud, and covered Tsarossi's crime. He insisted on not trying to pose as a hero, when in fact that was exactly what he was doing. He pushed the story of the wrong place at the wrong time Samaritarian, trying to get away with his scheme. Charles Ponzi dreamed of living the rich life, which he did for as short as some months. Ponzi's victims lost about $20 million in 1920 dollars. That's approximately 193 million in 2019. By comparison, Bernard Madoff's similar scheme that collapsed in 2008 cost his investors about 18 billion. That's 53 times the losses of Ponzi's scheme. Let's take a look at what we can learn from Charles Ponzi's scheme related to Bitcoin. Don't call frauds where someone asks for Bitcoin a Bitcoin scam. Ponzi's crime was not called a US dollar scam, too. The fraud was called after the guy who pulled it off and not after the money he cashed in. Bitcoin is not a Ponzi scheme. The only similarity between Bitcoin and the Ponzi scheme is the network effect of greed. Investors who get in early earn interest and tell others who also want to get rich quick. In a Ponzi scheme, there is a centralized actor, a leader or organization that collects investments and runs off in the end. Bitcoin is auditable. Bitcoin is an open blockchain and these are transparent. All transactions are traceable. It's possible to prove where funds are. If people would have invested Bitcoin in Charles Ponzi's scheme, it would have been possible to prove if the funds have been moved to buy a locomobile, for instance, or if they are still locked. A hundred years ago, Ponzi investors got a paper receipt with Ponzi's signature in return that promised a payout with interest. This is comparable to some of the or many ICO and DeFi projects from 2016 up until now that promised to be the next and better Bitcoin projects that only had a fancy website and a white paper managed to earn millions from hopeful investors who lost their money in the end. Bitcoin is decentralized. There's no company behind, no leader. 
Its software is built on consensus by all participants. No one can run away with your money as long as you hold your keys. It's yours, like the cash in your pocket. If you control the Bitcoin keys, it's your Bitcoin. If you don't control the Bitcoin keys, it's not your Bitcoin. You are back to a master-slave relationship with the bank. That's the end. I hope you liked this story. I recommend you read the full story written by Mitchell Zakoff in his book Ponzi's Scheme, which is the main source of my story. Other sources are Wikipedia and Wikimedia. You can find additional images at anita.link forward slash Ponzi. My goal is to educate as many people as possible about Bitcoin. If you like what I do, I ask you to contribute and support my work with a monthly subscription. You'll get bonus content, early access and ad-free episodes. If you prefer, you can also donate Bitcoin and Lightning. Visit anita.link forward slash p for Patron for more information. If you can't afford this or have other priorities, I understand. You can also support the show. Write a recommendation on Apple Podcasts. You can do that even if you do not have an iPhone. Go to Apple Podcasts, search for Anita Posh, scroll down to Reviews, click on Write a Review and write a few words. Thanks. Not your keys, not your coins proof of beats featuring Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Sound effects from freesound.org. That's it for today. If you like my show, please share it with your friends and hit the subscribe button in your podcast player now. Thanks to my sponsors who make it possible that I can produce the show. Localbitcoins.com, Shift Crypto with the Bitbox O2 and Coinfinity with their card wallet. Music. Start with yes, delicate beats. Idea, content and production. Yours truly, Anita Posch. <laughs>